Welcome to Mother and Refuge of the End Times. Today we present an interview. Testimony of an Argentine eyewitness of Carabandan. She met Padre Pio. Well, here we are in San Sebastián de Carabandan. We have the church tower and the bell tower here, and Mercedes Segovia de Ciber is with us. She's an Argentine eyewitness of the apparitions in Carabandan that she personally witnessed. And now she's going to tell us about the apparition when the angel gave a message to Conchita on June 18, 1965. Well, Mercedes, after that day, you stayed on to the following day to receive the message precisely from the hands of Conchita and from her house. She returned to the town after so many years of dreaming of returning. She's telling me it's been 48 years. So, hi, Mercedes. How are you? She is speaking to us, Pueblo de Maria. Well, how many times have we dreamt that you would give us your testimony right here in Garabandal? Before continuing with your testimony, I would like for you to tell us what you feel about returning to Garabandal. If I can speak because I haven't stopped crying since I arrived, because of the emotion, dreaming of actually walking again, which was something that seemed like an impossible dream, not believing it could come true. And well, I was sick for a very long time, and I offered the Virgin all my pains, my sufferings, among other things to be able to return. The Virgin gave me that gift on my birthday, August 5th. This year, it was confirmed that Pablo, my husband, would accompany me, and I was to return. So the truth is, I can honestly say that since August 5th, I felt an emotion that I couldn't stop thinking about or talking about. Even when I was at home, my family almost wanted to throw me out, because the only thing I wanted to talk about was the upcoming trip to Garabandan. Mercedes, we're going to tell people that they are going to see you for the first time. Let's see how it was during that time. How old were you? It is known that you came to Garabandal at the time of the apparitions. I was 20. It was quite curious, actually. The things that happen the way they do, because things happen because they have to happen on the day that they are supposed to. In 1961, I was at the college in Rome. I studied there for a year, and I met Padre Pio. I was in San Giovanni Rotondo with the school, and we went to his mass, and I confessed to him that it never occurred to me that it was anything extraordinary, not at all. I didn't know at that time either, despite having traveled several months in Spain, that the apparitions were already happening in 61. But when we returned with mom, dad, and younger sister Dolores in 65, as soon as we got there, we went south of the border. Some of our aunts told us that people were talking about these apparitions and that they already knew that on June 18th, the girls were going to receive a message from the Virgin that how Papa changed the entire trip slightly. That's why I tell you that things happen when they have to happen, right? The entire plan of the trip was changed in order to be in Garabandal on June 18th. I still have the map, all marked up by him with such a special circle that says in his handwriting, San Sebastián de Garamandán. So how old were you? I was 20 years old. 20 years. I was 20 years old 
When I met with Padre Pio, I was 16 years old. 16 years. And when we got to Cosio, I remember there was a route, but the path to get to Cosio was an adventure. Did you get there by train? No, no, everything was by car. All by car. All by car. And well, we had to leave the car in Cosio because they told us that they wouldn't let us drive up or if I didn't know what to do, we should come on foot. Like what it is today, a single lane road by car that goes to one side of the narrow road that is full of stones. He told us that they went up or down by donkey or in some cases by car or else walking because there was no other way. It was impossible, right? So well, we left the car in Cosio and we started the climb. Dad, Mom, my sister, and I, seven kilometers to Garamandan, and I arrived at the incredible town that seems like something out of the tale from the Middle Ages, where we knew absolutely no one. That is, as the Virgin says, you had to ask for a posada. No, because where were we going to sleep? A family that I now would like to know left us their home. My sister Maria Dolores and I slept in the kitchen on some big benches, and there was a stove in the middle around it, and Mom and Dad were given the bedroom, and so we slept there that night. We began to ask a little about the apparitions, but the townsfolk didn't talk much. They were very quiet, very reserved. The villagers from the north are very serious people, introverts, and especially with the subject as special as the apparitions of the Virgin. The next day, well, the whole day was waiting and asking and walking, and we went to the pines. We went up the alley, we went up to the pines to say the rosary, and it was getting late, and everyone was anxious, thinking, what time would it begin? What time would it begin? What time would it begin? And we asked, and nobody knew. Later, people often asked me, how many people were there? I don't know. There was a lot of people, but not so many people that it would be a thousand people or two thousand people. I have no idea. I just don't know. I didn't know anyone, and well, they told us that Shirley Conchita had already said that she was going to receive the message in the alley, in that little piece of the alley they called the picture. So we went to take the strategic positions to be close to the place, and well, there we waited and waited. It got dark, and it was quite cold. It seems like it was not, but the night was cool. Suddenly, a crowd was coming and heard saying, Hey, she's coming, she's coming, she's coming and the girls were all surrounded by civil guards protecting them. And when they got to the place called the painting, my sister and I were very, very close, and Mom and Dad were up the street, and suddenly you could hear crack. The fall was the sound of the knee bones. From Conchita? How awesome a sound that is never forgotten again, eh? Never again. Was there silence at that time, or were people talking? I don't remember. I was so attentive that it seemed to me that there was silence. It seems that maybe someone was speaking. I don't know. But what impressed me the most were the things they did to them. What did they do to them? Sheesh. They lit matches next to their eyes and pricked them all to see if they moved. No. She had outstretched arms and was in ecstasy. She did not laugh. She did not smile. She had an illuminated face after seeing the angel. But hers was not the face of happiness. It wasn't a happy face. Well, the message was very strong, wasn't it? Isn't that the case? She told us the message the next day. Hereafter, they wanted to lift her, and they could not between several men. They wanted to lift her, and they could not move her. It was as if she were a stone and weighed 10,000 kilos. And so a pretty long time went by, and then she got up and turned back. And we said, now what happens? Well, we asked the townsfolk, and they told us, not till tomorrow morning, go to the door of the house, and surely she will come out and say what the angel told her. So the next morning, my sister and I both went, and she came out, and we greeted her, and told her we were from Argentina, that we had come to witness the apparition. Well, we told her the whole story, especially that we wanted nothing more than to be with her, and to live that moment by her side and that if she could give us the message, because we were going to Argentina and we wanted people to know, to really know this. And yes, she gave each of us a paper written in small letters that at the time did not say cardinals or bishops, only priests. What she wrote said only by a priest. 
Then later, with the passage of time, did she clarify that all of them were priests first, and made reference to all clergy that way. Well, I didn't even know about that because I had returned to Argentina after staying there that day. It was late afternoon, and we left because we did not want to further abuse the hospitality of our host. But we came back with the feeling that we had to proclaim the message, that we could not remain silent. Dad had taken a lot of pictures. At that time, they were called slides, and those slides, they were passed through a viewer of a high quantity. Well, we got photos of the communion, of the day of communion where the host was seen. Many things, much more material besides, of course, the message of Christ, right? And we spent almost a year giving talks in Argentina in Buenos Aires. Unfortunately, until almost a year later, our parish priest, the parish priest of San Martín de Tours, told us that the church especially asked that Garamandad not be spoken of anymore. And later with the passage of time, when I heard of Garamandad again, I knew that just in 66, she had been with Paul the Sick. Conchita? Yes, Conchita, and that Paul the Six came to her. He had blessed her, but had said that, I bless you, and with me the whole church blesses you. And I thought right at that moment, our church was telling us we couldn't speak about it anymore, that it was clear. At that time, there was no internet. There were not so many things that today you find out about on the spot. Back then, everything went to the post office. But we kept everything, and it was archived for 40 years until, thanks to a cousin of mine who one day sent me an email, said, Mercedes, Mercedes, get on the internet. It's full of pages of Garabandal, and that's where I found you. Tell me, Mercedes. And so I rediscovered Garabandal, and now I'm here. Now, after so many years, you fulfilled your dream of going to Garabandal? After 48 years, yes. But now I'm very old. I am 68 years old. I lived many things, many joys, sufferings, pains, causing one to grow, right? Inside and out. The years passes by. The body is crushed a little, but the soul and the spirit, and especially the intellect, continue to function. That I know. Right now, I know that this is already seen differently, and everything that I did not value at that time of so many graces that I had, so many graces. It is incredible, right? How unconscious I was then, an unconscious teenager. Being next to Peel, standing next to him, having been the first group that went down to the tomb of St. Peter, I could recount a thousand things to you. Having gone to the Vatican to pray the rosary once a month for the world, what did I know? Thousands, thousands of things that happened to me over time, and despite things being extraordinary, from my understanding, I took them as normal things, until you realize that nothing was normal, that you are privileged and that somehow a chosen being, because there were not many people from Argentina in those days. I have no idea if there was anyone else but us. I don't know. Mercedes, look how much farther than before Argentina is now. Now that you can be here on the same day, imagine. Truly. I ask you this question, Mercedes. How do you see the people? Now does it bring you closer to how you see it now? To how you saw it before? Of course it was a long time ago for you. Yes, a lot closer. And now with my impediment, I have to try to get around. The only thing I did this morning was go to the church which I found spectacular, now repaired. Now these houses here nearby, and the ones I saw when I went by car with Pablo to the pines, I found that many of the homes were abandoned. I felt very sad, seeing so many closed and abandoned homes. I do not remember it being this way back in those days. It seems to me that it was an impoverished town with no paved roads, appliances, and without a number of modern things, but with the spiritual life above all else. It seemed to me of a depth and a remarkable perseverance, a town where every afternoon they rang the bell and all the people came to pray the rosary where there was a priest who went up every so often to say Mass, and where the essence of spirituality was not lost. Anyway, the town, the little I could see today, does remind me of the past, because imagine that it is still a small town, lost in the mountains, right? And from the pines where we went up, and I saw it from the pines, I said to Paul, Look how small it is. What place did Arch Lady choose? Small, and everything like Fatima. No? 
What place did he choose so humble, so simple, and so pure? No? So preserved from all stain of humanity? No? Then you ask me if it reminds me of yesterday's people. Yes, a lot. It is as if you were telling me that, yes, I am now living with marked emotion. Perhaps what I once lived very naturally today, I am living from the depths of my being. Mercedes, finally, tell me a little bit about how your children, your family, and your sister are experiencing this trip of yours. Tell me, to what extent do they celebrate this desire of yours to be able to reconnect with the people? As you know, one never does everything right, right? So of our children, there are some who are more religious than others. But yes, I love them a lot. And I know that everyone, everyone, and that everyone is praying fervently for Our Lady to help me recover. And my sister has already written to me several times and says, Mercedes, every minute of the way, I am there with you. I know that I'm experiencing everything with enormous joy. I think that, yes, with enormous joy, that is because they know how important it is for me, beyond the role each one plays at this moment in my life, right? Everyone is happy for me, everyone everyone, and especially my sister. I think your sister is capable of coming back when you come back. I think so. You see how this grace of God that sometimes, at the moment, one is not aware of everything that one experienced, and after that, where the chips fall. Exactly. And I think you're going to spread it, I'm sure. I hope so. I sure hope so. It is no coincidence that this you came to be a witness that after so long you were able to make this trip. I think windows are opened, and doors. What I do want to say is that everything seems to me to be very important for the cause of the Virgin and whatnot. I had no idea then until this cousin of mine told me that there's a friend who wants to see you because she says that thanks to you, well, it was not thanks to me but to the Virgin, but that she owes it to you that she had a son. And I said, what is this? Well, I finally saw her, and I met her, and she told me that when she was 15 years old, I gave a talk at her school, Sagrado Corazón, and my sister, Maria Dolores, gave a talk at the school where her boyfriend was. I don't know, maybe a year older than her? She was a little girl. And then each one told each other that they had separately heard this message from the Virgen of Garabandan. Well, eventually they got married, and she couldn't have children. Her father was a specialist, a gynecologist specializing in fertility. He performed all the treatments available and allowed by the church. There was no success. Then they said to each other, Why don't we start praying a rosary to Our Lady of Garabandal every day? And after two months, she became pregnant and had a son named Sebastian. I met him a year and a half ago. I knew the boy, and it was quite impressive because he told me, Look, I'm not going to tell you what happens to me with the Virgin. What I am going to tell you is that I have a very special relationship with her and that I have had her close every day of my life. And I thought, isn't this so incredible how God uses you as an instrument? But like this, how is it that there is disbelief about Garamandal? People should believe now, because if these people witnessed that this boy was truly born thanks to praying to the Virgin, the Virgin who is one but under the tutelage of Carmel of Garamandal, so... This would be my closing day, Santiago. Well, Mercedes, thank you very much for your testimony and hope that this encourages many witnesses who were witnesses before and were present yesterday that came to the meeting of the Ateneo de Satander that had not been here for years and they dared to come, no? To return. Yes, yes. I know that there is a time of God, but hey, you have to help him too. Yes, but you also have to look for it too, don't you? Yes, yes. But I see it as providential as was given to you, Mercedes. Until the last moment, you didn't know if you could travel or not, but you knew in your heart that there was something that was from our mother, that in spite of your impediment affecting your mobility and everything, that the trip was going to happen. Yes, yes. And despite the fact that Paul was at first sort of rebellious about coming to Garamandam, it wasn't easy. He would ask, what are we going to do for four days in Garamandan, and why do we have to come to Garamandan? Last night, I got on the road. Again, he asked me, but for what are you coming to Garamandan? And I didn't really know what to say. Well, I said, well, 
I'm going to meet the Virgin. Well, what do I know? I don't even know what to tell you. So everyone who has lived this should come back and be encouraged to speak. I think it's very important. And with all the apparitions, don't you think? Wouldn't you say? Witnesses who were fortunate enough to witness something good have to say it because the world is living, but doing it without God. Look, it's what the Pope said, isn't it? Not this Pope, but Benedict XVI, that Europe today is a continent in need of evangelization. Before they evangelized America, but now they are being evangelized. So I think that all the people who are lucky enough to have lived this have an obligation to say it. You can't remain silent. Well, Miss Sedis, thank you very much for your testimony from the town of San Sebastián de Garabandán. Your dream came true. Thank you. Thank God. Thank you. Thank you for your support. May the Immaculate Heart of Mary be your refuge. Amen. <laughs>